Well, good morning. It's great to be here. This will be my first and last time doing this. Uh, next week, Bergen will be back. So he will take us through uh, Joshua and Ruth. Today, we're going to do an overview of both of those. And it's, um, it's entitled, Choose This Day Whom uh, You Will Serve. And in case I don't mention it next week, it'll be Joshua chapters one and two. But right now, we're just going to do the overview. Uh, choose this day whom you will serve. We know Joshua uh, asked that question. And it's very important in our lives. If you look at and uh, if you look at it, uh, how do we make the choices in our lives? And most of us, I think, would say it's what looks good or looks bad. Good, we go for. Bad, we stay away from. Is it by what somebody else tells us? And it depends. I'm sure everybody in this room has a trusted or trusted friends they would rely on. And maybe in your lifetime, you have been one of those trusted friends. Uh, is it because we desire something greater than what we currently have? And that isn't to say that moving upward is not a, a good thing. It's just how we do it, or is a bad thing. Or is it because of our emotions? How many of us have made a decision in an emotional moment and wished we'd never, ever gone there? You know, that's like a form of mental suicide, I guess, or whatever. Or how do we choose who we follow? And isn't that a great topic for 2024, where actually the fire in Amarillo got more coverage than the presidential race, but that's very, very rare. So how do we choose? Is it because they are more attractive than other leaders? Uh, do they seem to be better leaders? Is it because they share a common race, gender, religion, or belief system? Let's go back to the 2012 presidential election. What did we have then? We had Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. And there were some church members who were really in a bind. Because here's this liberal and here's this woman. Oh boy. So those were, you got to look at that. Or how they make us feel. I don't feel good. He doesn't make me feel good. <coughs> Feelings can sometimes be very deceptive, can't they? I feel like this is a good investment. Enron was, but it ain't no more, okay? Or uh, who they're supported by, the endorsements. If we see some candidate maybe running for a lower office below president, being endorsed by somebody, we say, well, I like that somebody, so this candidate must be good. <laughs> now, Bergen gives us this. This is a quote from him. So this is Bergen 1, verse 1. Okay? <laughs> he says, I don't think I need to remind anyone that this is an election year. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Okay? <laughs> Many of us have, may have already participated in early voting in the primary election this past week. For me, I will have to make the long trip to the polls from the church offices to the North Foyer on election day to vote. <laughs> so, so let's pray that he has a safe journey. <laughs> okay? But... We do, our lives are, revolve around making decisions. Well, also, how many of you changed electric companies recently? Okay, I mean, it's just, there are all kinds of things that we have to just, how many of you decided not to go anywhere, or what, what was it, three Sundays ago when we had the snowfall? You made a decision to stay in. And you hope that the electric company is selected and keep the electricity in. <laughs> But um, toward the end of the book of Joshua, and we're going to jump to the end, but this is going to be taken up. As I said, next week is two chapters, and it's entitled, For the Lord Your God, He Is God. But toward the end of the book, Joshua gathers uh, the people together and tells them, Choose this day who you will serve. 
By this point in the book, the Israelites have already entered the promised land and are now trying to decide who or what they want would follow. Now, let's go back in our history just a few months ago when we studied Jeremiah. Did they make all the right decisions? And did they listen to the prophets? Okay, so here we are. Decide who or what they're going to follow. Baal or uh, the Asher Poles <laughs> worship that, or for Gentiles, Gentiles had their so-called gods. And this is after they had entered, and for the Jews, this is after they entered the promised land. And we'll talk about entering the promised land as well in a minute. Just an overview. In the book of Ruth, Ruth and Naomi are faced with similar challenges. Maybe they're not exactly the same, but they are not, uh, they're not obviously leading the conquest against Canaan. However, they have to figure out what their life should be as a widow and her daughter-in-law living in Israel. Both of them are women. So what does that tell us about their status living in Israel? Not much. It's not there, is it? It's very low. And they decide about whether or not to follow God. And that's an interesting study in Ruth. I've, I've never done a study uh, as, as a teacher or as a student. I've never done a study of Ruth, but I think that's going to be good. It's going to be very good for us. So please come back. Okay. We get we get paid by the number of people who are here. And I'm going to get struck by lightning. So I'm going to shut up. Okay. But uh, they're trying to figure out life as a widow and her daughter-in-law uh, following God. In this study, Connor tells us, or Bergen, I wish he, I wish he had one first name and one last name. He's got two last names. So our, he is telling us in this study, we will look at all, we will look at the things and the people of Israel, um, that the people of Israel were seeking to follow and how God revealed to them that he was their best option. And he still is today. But they didn't, they didn't see it that way, did they? We know that. All right, the promised land. This is uh, a starting point. Uh, we need to uh, mention the land's significance in the background as we're doing it. We also do a disservice to both historical understanding of Joshua, but also the modern understanding of Joshua. Now, back in Genesis 15, God, as a part of making, uh, was made the covenant with Abraham, says that he will give Abraham the land from the wadi of Egypt to the Euphrates. Now, what do we know a wadi to be? As far, yes, the, what's that? As far? No, actually, what it is, is it's, not, it's a partial, it's a sometimes river. Uh, the wadis in the in Saudi Arabia look like swine pits, but what happens is when they get a lot of rain, which they do, like an inch at a an inch and an hour on that hard surface, and these these wadis will fill up. But that's where it is. Anyway, the wadi of Egypt to the Euphrates. This becomes the ancestral home of uh, the Israelis or Israelites and the generations of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they build their homes, and they raise their families, have their families, and raise them in um, the, the promised land, in Canaan. And in uh, Moses and Joshua's time, it became a reminder of what used to be. The land was promised to them by God, along with freedom from slavery and the oppressive rule of Egypt. What do we know about the Israel, Israeli, uh, Israelites, about that? As soon as they got out of town and got to the Red Sea, what did they say? You just brought us out here to drown us. We want to go back home. And then when the Red Sea parted and they got into the wilderness, you just wanted to let us come out here and die. We want to go back home. So were they satisfied with this covenant? 
And what did, what did uh, Joshua say? Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to the spy case when Joshua was an operative with, for the CIA. Okay. <laughs> but they wanted to go, they wanted to turn back and go back to the land of slavery because they did not trust God. Here he was. You can choose God or you cannot choose God. They didn't know which one to choose. They didn't know whether they could trust him or not. Now, the Exodus, and by the way, uh, the fall <clears throat> quarter is going to be on Exodus. At least that's what our um, Bergen uh, tells us. That's when we go back after summer. Are we going to do 2 Samuel or not? Uh, Bergen has not said yet, Jim. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we're, it's just kind of on hold right now. Okay. Well, we'll unhold it by June. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> we may come in here and say, okay, guys. Still on hold. <laughs> I've got these puppets. We can use it. <laughs> they, don't, they don't record this and keep it, do they? <laughs> they? They record it. I don't know whether they keep it or not. Because if they keep they... it, I guess it's too late now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, the Exodus. Just as the concept of the promised land is something to consider uh, reminding us in classes, so is Exodus. And that's why we're going to study it in uh, the fall. Now, it is also good to hit the points of why Joshua is leading the people into the land. Moses was the leader who put up with everything from the day they left Egypt to the day they got across the river. And those were a lot of days there. Uh, and a lot of weeks and years and, month, and months and years that they were going to uh, cross into the promised land, but he never got to go there. He got to see it, but he didn't get to go there. As one of the, uh, if, if we look at Hebrews, he is certainly one of the uh, giants of faith in the, in the letter to the Hebrew, or the Hebrew letter. He was the leader of the people, who got the people out of captivity under Egyptian rule with the charge to bring the people to the promised land. And the whole thing was, it's, it's given to them. It isn't a matter of, you have to make a down payment now, and you will have 10 million monthly payments for the rest of your life, plus your families and everybody else's. It's given to them. And they had their, and then uh, he also, uh, when they went to the promised land, uh, God said you will live under God's rule and with the Torah, which was the legal codes. And we talked about that when Paul was saying, <laughs> that was for them then. We don't go back to it now, Christians, Jewish Christians. All right. However, the people would rather return to their old ways, and they at times desire to return to Egypt and return to the yoke of slavery instead of following Moses. Well, then we have the spies. I like that. Does, does everybody remember in the 60s and 70s, there were a lot of spy TV programs? I mean, that was the end thing from Get Smart, where that guy couldn't do anything. But he had a shoe that he could talk on. And that's the early uh, <laughs> cell phones. <laughs> Yeah, you can see now, take your shoe off and start talking into the phone <laughs> or talking into your shoe. They would say, come on, guys, you in the white coats. Come on, it's time to take him back. All right, but the spies, and this is in Numbers 13. Uh, we will, uh, uh, we're going to see from time to time, as Bergen has this set out, that we will focus on Joshua, we will focus on Ruth, but there's also some of the other... Uh, books that we have to look at in some detail. This brings us to the story about the spies. Moses has led the people to the border uh, of the promised land. However, however, I said it was handed to them. They did have to fight for it. Okay? Uh, and, and sometimes sometimes if we work for something, it makes it more valuable to us, doesn't it? 
If somebody hands it to us, we say, oh, thank you, and put it in the closet. So I think it's important for us to see that God made them work for it. Now, they were going to get it. I mean, it being the land. They're going to get it. But he is, he wants them to work for it. All right. However, before they were going to have the conquest, they wanted to spy out the land. I mean, you're talking about veterans? That's what veterans would do. If you're going to take a, uh, if you're going to attack an enemy, you don't go and say, well, I don't know anything about the land, the terrain, the de- time of day, whatever. Uh, let's just go. Let's just go in there. See what happens. That's not the way they were going to do it. And they sent out how many spies? Twelve. Twelve spies. That's a very unusual number in the Bible. <laughs> twelve spies, twelve apostles, twelve dozen eggs, twelve <laughs> eggs in a dozen or whatever. But here we go. To spy out the land. Now Joshua and Caleb were two of those. What did the ten come back and say? You can't take it. We can't take it. What? They're so big. And they've got this. They've got helicopters. I don't know. They've got all of these things. We can't possibly whine, 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 whine. It was just a continuation of whining, generational whining. All right? But what did Joshua and Caleb say? They can take it. And why did they say that? Because God's on their side. Because God's on their side. These these uh, um, people occupying Canaan at that time <laughs> may have been big and threatening and strong and well equipped. But did it really matter? No, it doesn't. And what did they call it? What did Caleb and uh, Joshua call it? The land of milk and honey. They had a great report. And Caleb is the one to urge the people at this time to take charge and they can enter the land and conquer it. There, God's on our side. The people disagree. They know better and push back against the idea that Moses should lead the people and that they were were better off going back to Egypt. Now, I'm sure some of you in your lifetime had the worst job you've ever had. And after you completed that job, would you whine and cry and want to go back to it? Boy, I mean, and what were they doing? They were groaning when they were there. It was so bad. And now, well, let's go back to the groaning. All right. This is what leads to what? When they refuse, they say, no, we're not, we don't want to go in there. What do they get? Starts with a 40. 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. God hasn't given up on the idea. That we're going into Canaan. We've just postponed it for 40 years. And that got rid of a lot of the generations, the complaining generations. Moses, at the end of his life uh, and the end of uh, Deuteronomy, Moses gives his final charge to the people as uh, part of this. uh, He lays out the law to the people that's included in Deuteronomy. But he also says that they have to choose between the curses and the blessings of the law. And then he adds to that. Either you choose to live with God or to die without God. Now that's, I mean, how hard is that? If you had to vote on that, show of hands, how many would say we want to live with God? Okay, a couple of you. How about the children? No, come on. The rest of you are going to do that too. Right? See, I see some of you are non voters. All right. But, or die with God. Oh, I want to do without God. I want that. No. Moses charged to Joshua. Now, there was a transition. Do you think Moses was an experienced leader of the Israelites? I think he was. Led them out of slavery, led them across the Red Sea. And then when they went up to Mount Sinai, while he was up there, when they got to Mount Sinai, built the uh, uh, calf, the 
uh, what was it called? Bronze calf? No, or, golden. golden. Golden calf. That was the golden, yeah. It's, yeah, it's the golden uh, calf. Thank you. Built the golden calf and they were going to worship. He experienced all of that. Then he got the great privilege of having a lead <clears throat> for 40 years in the wilderness where they were not too happy. <laughs> but then he passes on to uh, Joshua and in the chapters, Joshua is charged to be strong and courageous and to be more importantly, or uh, it is more importantly, but being strong and courageous is important in the face of what he was going to have to be doing. Be a servant of the Lord and his leadership <coughs> of the people. <coughs> oh, no. We're all ready to the conclusion. Well, or this will be the conclusion in a minute. Well, let's start over again. Let me, <laughs> let me begin again. It was so good the first time. Yes, Is this study going to be for how long? Three months. Three months. It's a quarter. It's a, I, I know you have to, ask that question, have to ask that question because we've kind of chopped things up. Yes. Yeah, okay. It is going to be uh, March, April, May. And then the summer would be June, July, and August. I got the summer. You got the summer. I, I know. But we don't know what we're studying in the summer, yeah. but it's, the summer is coming. <laughs> and we will go back in the summer and wish, oh, that, that winter was so nice. <laughs> okay, Israelites. All right, but the conclusion <laughs> is, in a world where we are, and uh, Bergen says, forced to make choices. A lot of times our choices are our own. We're not necessarily forced to do that. Now I realize as you as parents, when you were parents, you had a family to feed and to clothe and to take care of. So in a way you were forced to make a choice. Do I work here? Do I work there? Do I work here for overtime on Sunday? Or do I work seven, five days a week over here? To make choices about everything. How many of you have plans of where you're going to eat after services? For those of you who are going to the second service. Okay. Where are we going to go to eat? That's a decision, isn't it? And this is what this is. There's a lot what to wear. I was going to wear shorts this morning, but, I decided not. <laughs> but also um, there are bigger choices like our occupation. When I was growing up, I was going to play baseball. Uh -uh. And that that never even came close. Okay, but then, and I'll tell. Is it okay if I tell you this personal story? Sure. And it's and it's not it's G rated, so don't worry about that. <laughs> How many of you remember the TV program Perry Mason? And not not our wonderful yeah. former elder, <laughs> <laughs> but I was an addict to Perry Mason. I loved it. I watched it every week, and I decided then and there, in the sixth grade, <laughs> that I was going to go to law school. Okay, and as it turned out, that's what happened. I went to law school. I went to law school in Sacramento, California, and that law school had just received a very large endowment from Raymond Burr. And if you know who he is, he was Mary Mason. Yeah. So I thought, hmm, <laughs> this was a long shot plan, wasn't it? <laughs> but it, uh, but you see how we have to make those choices, and sometimes it's time to uh, move on to another, <clears throat> another, not necessarily another occupation, but maybe another job somewhere. For example, when I was in Reno, working in the district attorney's office, using the law degree that Raymond helped me get. Uh, after nine years of working in domestic violence and crimes against children, it was time for a change. Not a change to become a baseball player or a change to become some, a singer. Neither one of those would work. Uh, but 
a chain, and I came here to LCU. And then at a certain point, everything was going well in the program. We had things up and running. We had good people. We had a, uh, a good professor, and I got along. We got along very well. So I decided now it was time to move on after 11 years at LCU. That's not changing occupation, but those are decisions we make. And this is what I think God wanted. Because I'll tell you, when I opened the Christian Chronicle in November of 2004, and I was looking, uh, they need a criminal justice program at Lubbock Christian <laughs> yeah. University. And, I, and I've been to Texas before. I was down in uh, uh, Fort it was Fort Hood, now it's Fort uh, Cavazas. I knew that that part of Texas, but I had no idea where Dubon was. So I got a map and I finally found it. And I, well, I'll apply for this. But I, I, I thought, I don't, I don't know that it's going to work, but here we go. And then I got the call, we would like to have you come down here for an interview. Well, that's a little bit different than coming across town. And they said, I will pay the way. I will pay for your uh, hotel. I said, dude, they're, they're serious here because uh, I don't think they're going to spend Okay. So I get here and go through the interview and then get hired. And, and it was it was meant to be. I had burned out with the district attorney's office because it was six days a week we were working. And it could get and with children and uh, domestic violence. And it could get too good. All right. But anyway, that's that's I'm just crying on your shoulders because we have the time. <laughs> <laughs> but we should also look about our occupation, where to live. You know, I came to Lubbock. I'd never been here. I'd been to Dallas at the Dallas the Metroplex. I've been to the to uh, uh, Copper's Cove and uh, the two counties down there. Gatesville. <laughs> yeah, well, Gainesville is Gate. No, Gatesville. Yeah. Gatesville is close to Copper's yes, Cove. Yes, it's in, uh, it's in the uh, Colleen area. But uh, Colleen and, and uh, those that are, I was very familiar with them, and I was familiar with Temple and those because I drive out and go up here. And then uh, I did uh, venture forth to set, we went to San Antonio, so I knew where that was, saw the, saw the Alamo. It was nothing like what we saw on TV when we were kids because they had... I, I do not recall these big buildings around it. I cannot imagine why you would go to the Alamo to defend the Alamo when you got these great big buildings. <laughs> but that, that's, those are things we have to make. And then I think it's very important on how to treat one another. That is something that will be with us for any, any occupation, any church uh, things we do, Anything we do in, for example, belong to Kiwanis, belong to service clubs, do those kinds of things. It's how we treat people, and that is important. And the choice both Joshua and Moses and the people at the end of their lives is the most important. Whom do you serve? That is the important thing. <laughs> and... <laughs> How do we serve the Lord? What may be, and I don't like this, he writes here, what may be preventing you? I think us is a better term. Because I'm not going to sit up here and say, what is preventing you from serving the Lord? You, you, you. It's us. This is a team effort. I didn't get on a baseball team, but this is a team effort in this world. So we can better serve the Lord. And that's what we're going to be focused on. And that I have nothing else to say. Anybody else want to talk about a big childhood event? Would you like to talk about when you celebrated your 75th birthday? No, we won't do that. <laughs> or your 80th birthday. Any questions, comments, sir? I always remember that Perry Mason's secretary was Della Reese. Della Street Della. was her name. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And he had Paul, what was his name? Is and, and how many cases did he lose? It was offensive. Criminal offensive. It was just one in the whole time. Okay. Well, 
most four defense attorneys pled their uh, defendants guilty because the evidence was there. And this idea that Hollywood has that, oh, you frame everybody. No, we don't frame everybody. <laughs> Just some of the people. Uh, no, I don't think, I never. I know you. Did. And none of the people I work with ever. TV That's all I treat. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I was just thinking about the Bible and some of the things that are said stay with us and mm -hmm. help us to go on. Right. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Right. It seems like a very simple little verse, but the Bible has a lot of those kind of catchy and they that's your choice. Right. Do you want to serve the Lord or do you not? Just, and what should we be looking at when we? Because not all decisions are. Uh, how many of you remember the robot that would say, "Danger, danger, danger!" Will Robinson. Well, we don't get when we get an offer to do something. We don't get a danger, danger with it, or there is no danger. We we need to make the decision based on what we believe and how we how we <coughs> accept that this is God's will. But Jim, you know, they were wanting to go back to Egypt or thought they were, but they were actually killing their baby boys in, in Egypt. Yes. Yes, let's go back there. That's a that's a great country to live in. Well, they had fish and leeks and cucumbers there. They were tired of manna. Yeah, they were. They were tired of manna. And then when they got... Uh, what was it? Quail. Quail. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is different. And then 15 minutes later, oh, we're tired of quail. All we get is quail, quail, quail. So it's like probably some of you uh, parents, <clears throat> uh, when the moms prepared macaroni and cheese, <laughs> ah, I can. So <laughs> even if they had macaroni and cheese, they would probably complain about it. Okay, any other comments? Thank you very much. And we sign up. Oh, hello to our. We have it. We do. All right. The Appletons. What's that? The Appletons are, are always on. Good to see you guys. I can't see you, but you can see me. I'd love to see you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.